Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 22 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Thank you, Zaki. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank you for the great response to our last episode with uh, Professor Sherman Jackson. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed recording. Uh, but moving on to uh, to our latest episode and our newest episode, we are really excited about having this conversation today. And Zaki, why don't you tell us who's on the show? Well, we're joined by Harun Mogul, and Harun is a senior correspondent at Religion Dispatches. He's the author of My First Police State and The Order of Light, and has been published in CNN, The Guardian, Salon, Boston Review, Foreign Policy, and Quartz. He's appeared on CNN, MSNBC, Fox, Al Jazeera, and the History Channel. And he is allergic to everything. So... That's that's one small area where I feel like I can I can uh, be superior to Harun because I'm not allergic to everything. So thank you thank you for sharing that with us, Harun. Thank you for joining us. Almost everything. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, water almost. is okay. Water is fine. Well, at least there is that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah, this is great. So this this is as Pervez said. This is a conversation we've been meaning to have for for quite a long time. And Harun also, uh, we need to make sure we mention this is a fellow at ISPU, which is the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. So uh, and they they've been uh, a big help uh, as far as uh, securing. Uh, previous guests on our show, so yeah. we're, we're very um, uh, honored to be associated with them in any way. Uh, so, Harun, there's there's so much stuff going on that it's almost like we, we, we're, we're at a loss. We don't know, we don't know where to start, and, and we feel like we need, we need your guidance here. There's, there's a lot of anti-Muslim invective in the world right now, and uh, this is a conversation we were having off mic. I feel like if Robert Spencer... Noted anti-Muslim, noted Islamophobe Robert Spencer is targeting you by name. You're probably doing something right. I hope so. I think that that would possibly be my only achievement in life. That, <laughs> uh, we don't really have eulogies at Janazas, but perhaps we can have a bid'a at mine, an innovation, and then we can have a eulogy at my janaza and say Robert Spencer knew his name. <laughs> Now, and now, little, little maybe bit of that would get me here. some extra prayers, and you know, maybe that would get me uh, like a little bit of a little bit of love in the afterlife. I don't know. You, you never know. Well, it's it's hilarious. We've got Ayan Hirsi Her- Ali hate tweeting or tweet bombing or whatever you would call it. Wajat Ali, a past guest of ours and friend of Haroon's, and uh, we've got uh, Robert Spencer name dropping Haroon. So, um, wow. And she called me an extremist on Fox News, which was that wonderful. she did. That Not she did. Name, she you're a gentleman. <laughs> But can I say the weirdest thing about that interview, and, and this kind of tells you everything you need to know about Islamophobia, I wasn't in the studio with her. I have no idea why. Hmm. I was in the basement. I believe I was in a blast-proof room. I can't be sure See, because I don't know what that happened is so funny room. because you know, to, 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 to me as the as, as again, I was I just watched it as an as an audience member. Uh, or, or, or public audience uh, member, um, I thought you were at a different location, so that's why they had you off, you know, on camera versus in the studio sitting across from the lovely Megyn Kelly. Yes, and I, I think actually that could be the perfect explanation for Islamophobia and bigotry and everything. Is that you, when you when you're confronted with something you don't understand, what is your interpretation? Now, it could have been possible that they were not at Fox News World Headquarters in New York City, although that seems a little bit strange to me because mm. where else would Megyn Kelly be? Uh, it could yeah. be possible that they thought I was a threat and therefore, right. you know, um, or, or right. honestly, it, it could just be a, a strategy. It probably a lot harder to bully or harangue someone if you're physically next to them. Sure. So I noticed Bill O'Reilly, for example, does this a lot where his, his guest or his, his selected anti guest, shall we say the one who's, right. who's there to be the punching bag will, right. will be bullied, but never, never on, on stage or in the studio with him. Whereas his preferred guest, his favorite guest, his ideological fellow traveler will be physically present next to him. So they have this kind of nice camaraderie and then the bad guy is on camera. Mm. somewhere else. Well, and it's, it's a lot harder to uh, have somebody's mic cut off if they're sitting right next to you. Very good point. Very good point. Next time I should insist that I, I would like he might to... have learned he might have learned something from I don't know if you remember like right this was like maybe days or weeks after nine eleven or maybe a few months this. even after nine eleven. Yeah, he yeah. had uh what was it, one of the one of the sons, right? Of one of the victims who died That's in the right. in the towers. Yep. Who had a completely different viewpoint than Mr. O'Reilly and uh that, that, that interview got ugly quick. And that gentleman was sitting right across from him. 
And you know what's interesting is that was before YouTube. That was before viral videos. Yeah, yeah. Because it well, would have so gotten a lot more it should melt down, right? But things find a way to showing that's, up on YouTube. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. <laughs> but, we'll do but, it yeah. live. We'll do it now. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, now, just to contextualize this conversation we're having, uh, mm-hmm. Harun wrote an op-ed for CNN under right. the title, Don't Be Fooled by Pamela Geller. And yes. the, the, the gist of the piece, and, and forgive me, Arun, I'm, I'm doing it a disservice, but the gist of it was to say Pamela Geller, in the wake of this, this um, Drah Muhammad contest, followed by a, a terrorist uh, a shooting incident, uh, in the wake of that, don't view Pamela Geller as some kind of defender of free speech because of uh, you know, all the variety of ways in which she's clearly not that. So, so in response to your response to Pamela Geller, Robert Spencer very gallantly uh, uh, jumped to Pamela Geller's defense with a piece called Don't Be Fooled by Harun Mogul. We all love each other. Yeah. We're one big, happy, Sharia-compliant family. (laughs) I feel like you missed the chance to respond with Don't Be Fooled by Robert Spencer telling you not to be fooled by me, and, you know, we just keep going. I should have pitched a Don't Be Fooled by Me piece to CNN. (laughs) That might have been the last thing I pitched to them, but... (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, this is, but this is, I think you you are in kind of a unique position in that you have enough of a, a national profile that you are able to get a platform through something like CNN, uh, which is, you know, relatively mainstream, and you're able to give voice to what I think is a, a perspective that's sorely lacking, which is the regular everyday muslim uh perspective so so i think just just to sort of backfill this this information for your for our audience um uh, how how did you reach this point well i this is this is something I, I feel like i have to say a lot of folks asked me after the cnn piece after the fox piece why are you why are you engaging these people they're bigots they're mm-hmm. hate mongers you're just giving them what they want which is attention which i think is entirely the wrong approach i i think that In the Muslim community, and I've seen this growing up, uh, a a lot of our responses to problems tend to be ignoring them. That if we just pretend like X is not there, then X does not exist and we can go on our merry way. And and we have a very blinkered view of the world. And life is a lot more complicated than than the conversations we can have in social media. But to, to put it simply... It's a little bit like a football game. I mean, real football, not soccer or whatever that corrupt Swiss thing is that <laughs> taken down by, by U.S. military action. Uh, but, you know, like I'm, I'm sure everyone knows what a football game is. And, and if you don't, we should retake your citizenship test with you. Uh, but it's it's the kind of thing where someone needs to block in order for someone else to advance the ball. So so we need people in our community who pin down the bigots and the haters uh, because otherwise they have they have airtime. They're the right. ones... Whenever Muslims ask, why don't people hear us condemning terrorism? It's not that they don't hear you. It's that the people on TV keep saying that we're not doing it. So if you have one news channel like Fox, which features of of the majority of its Muslim guests, people who are insisting over and over and over again that Muslims don't condemn terrorism, Muslims are sympathetic to terrorism, Islam is itself terrorism, then what do you think people are going to take away from it? So so we need to develop within our communities, and, and we haven't done a good enough job of it yet. Uh, people who who can at least block, who can stop these conversations from going any farther than they've already gone, and they've already gone way too far, uh, while other people do the hard work of building institutions and and working for social justice and working to increase inclusion and and all those good, positive, happy things. So I, I want to be the punching bag. That's my goal in life. I didn't want to be the punching bag, but now I want to be the punching bag. Well, when when did that happen? When did when did yeah. the, the the you know when did you turn the dial from uh, from one to the other? I think I'm a wannabe renaissance man, as in I have many interests, none of which I've ever had the dedication or intelligence to actually pursue. So I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to get into traffic engineering. I had weird obsession with trains, uh, with planes and airports, but I don't really talk about that anymore because people get the wrong idea. Uh, now I, I just remember that we're live. So even more now people it's get the wrong for all idea times, all so. time, permanently. We're going to add that to your bio now. It's like the day of judgment on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Don't, don't add that to my bio. That would be terrible. <laughs> Arun is interested in planes and other forms of travel. <laughs> that would be absolutely wonderful. No, so but but when actually when I was in college, what I wanted to do is I, I wanted to study uh, Eastern Europe. I've always been fascinated by Eastern Europe. I don't know why. I wanted to study Russian and Czech and Hungarian and 
become a professor in a small town somewhere in Eastern Europe. And, and that was it. And maybe write books. That was pretty much it. And then 9-11 happened. And like a lot of us who came of age around 9-11, we were forced into a certain posture. And whether we like it or not, this is the reality uh, that we're facing. And, and we have to do something about it so that maybe somewhere down the road, when there's another kid who wants to become a professor of whatever, uh, she or he doesn't have to think about what about my community, what about my identity, but will have the right and the ability and the privilege to do those things that they want to do, not what they have to do. You know, I, I always like to, to also draw, you know, pull a little bit behind the curtain a little bit and, and, and you know, with our guest and, and kind of talk about, um, so yeah. now I think you, you hail from the East Coast, correct? You're, you're, you're from, uh, what, Massachusetts? Massachusetts, originally? yeah. Yeah. Born and raised? Born and raised Western Massachusetts. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, and, your, and your parents uh, are originally from Pakistan? Yeah, they're from Pakistan. Okay. Okay. And so now you, um, I think you also went to school in New York though, right? Yeah. I think was, was both undergrad and, uh, your, your, your uh, further studies at Columbia. That is how much I liked Western Massachusetts. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Get so tell me us the a little hell bit. out of here. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, as again, I think we, we were talking off mic as someone who's, who lived in the adjacent suburb to yours, Yes. Uh, I can certainly relate. Uh, we would go to Connecticut just e- even to go to the Target. So yeah, um, you know, to the to the nearest grocery store would be across the border in Connecticut. Um, anyway, uh, but uh, no offense to our listener, our, our listeners out in Western Mass. Uh, we love you. We love Springfield. Uh, <laughs> the, the NBA Hall of Fame is there, man. You can't you can't go wrong. So um, anyway, uh, uh, so Harun, uh, what, what were some of your uh, sort of academic interests? Uh, you know. While you were at Columbia, uh, what, what did you sort of study, focus on? So I, I went to NYU and uh, honestly okay. had no idea what I was doing for my undergrad. Uh, I, I am at Columbia now, so I did my my yeah. master's at Columbia, and I'm doing my PhD for the however many next centuries it takes to complete <laughs> it. Uh, but I went to NYU, and, and honestly, I don't know if this is a, a common thing for – maybe it's just youth when you don't really know what you want to do and you just do what other people tell you to do. And then when you look back on it, you think, damn it. I should have done something more interesting. So I, I was basically pre-law. My every <laughs> everyone around me was either a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, and and law was kind of new at that point. This is the late '90s, early 2000s. So for South Asians, medicine was number one. Engineering was number two, and then third was shady uncle with import export business. Uh, <laughs> but nobody knew what shady uncle did. But shady uncle had an S class, so shady uncle was socially accepted. <laughs> Uh, so and then once we found out that corporate lawyers could have five series, then they were welcomed into the circle as well. They were. Yes, we were. Yeah. You know, we actually practice an interesting form of eugenics. I thought about this because you can't get married in a South Asian community or many South Asian communities until you have a graduate degree, preferably a doctorate. It's like we're telling you you're not allowed to breed until you've proven yourself. And, and doctors <laughs> so, so there is a, a strain of fascism, perhaps, in, in South Asian communities that needs to be commented on. I have no idea where this, as you can tell, I'm also affected by ADD. I have no idea where I'm, I'm going. I'm just waiting for that quote to be used out of context. Is... Don't be fooled by South Asian doctors. <laughs> there, uh, there, there's fascism in the South Asian community. We would be the most interesting fascists ever. Can you imagine fascists with gulab jamun? It would be absolutely just be the weirdest thing in the world. It's not, it's not very threatening, right? It's, it's, I mean, what kind of fascists are contented to be late to everything? It's not. That's not fascism. Is make the trains run on time, not late to problem. everything. Soft in the middle, eating all that gulab jamun and biryani, and uh, yeah, and, and yeah. Don't know about leg day at the gym. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, really? Those are the kind of fascists you that's want, right. ideally, right? I mean, that's right. Ideally, yes, we would like our fascists to be doughy and out of shape, <laughs> and on insulin and statins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and able to prescribe them for themselves. That's the yeah, amazing. That's true. Self-diagnose and self-prescribe. Move. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so suffice it to say, I, I went to NYU and, and I did a humanities thing, and then nine eleven happened, and I really thought, I honestly thought that. This would all die down after a year or two, and then I would pursue a law career. And here we are uh, a decade and a half later, and, and we have things like ISIS in the world. And it seems like the heartland of the Muslim world is falling apart. And we have Pamela Geller, Robert Spencer, Ayan Hersieli. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if, if any of us would have seen that coming necessarily. It is disheartening, uh, but it, it, it does mean for a lot of us that, that this is what we're going to have to be doing for, for a good while longer. You know, uh, I, 
it, as something Professor Jackson, I'm, just the comment he made on the last episode uh, that kind of stuck with me or, the, or what you said just kind of reminded me of, you know, it was that, you know, it's, it's not always it's not always terrible having enemies, you know, because they sort of keep you sharp. Right. They keep you they, they, they sort of up your game or they cause you to up your game. And I think uh, certainly if if. if you know, post 9-11 Muslim discourse, not only internally, you know, I think within the community, but also, uh, you know, with regards to mainstream audience, um, I, you know, I, I would I would probably hold that to be true in, in a sense that, you know, it's, it, you know, pre 9-11, I almost feel like there was this sort of ideological playground, you know, where, where, where that, 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 that Muslims played in. And now um, we've just become more, yeah, more astute, more, more, more savvy. At least we are. We're, 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 we're getting there. I agree with you. I agree with you. It's it's a uh, it's a good thing for now that our opponents aren't particularly formidable. Uh, most Islamophobes are are pretty simplistic, crude thinkers. They're not threatening, uh, in at least not in the U.S. I think in Europe the situation is different and and a lot worse. Uh, but but for now it's it's a good thing because it does force us to question a lot of things that we've been taught about Islam or that we assumed are true about Islam or should be true about Islam. And I would actually, I'd go farther and say the same thing about what's happening in the Muslim world. I think contrary to a lot of the ways in which some Muslims perceive the reality uh, in the global South or in the Middle East or South Asia, that Muslims actually have a lot more control over their destiny than they assume, uh, mm-hmm. especially in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, yeah. and, and it's a pretty ugly thing to see, but it's a necessary thing. Uh, it, you can't really become responsible until you have the freedom to be responsible. And, and that's going to take some while, uh, some, some time to work out, unfortunately. Well, you know, the, the thing, you know, a lot of, I think, as you, as you alluded to, right, people in our sort of general age range, we, we look at nine 11 as that moment where um, things change as far as how, how people in our community engage uh, with the quote unquote mainstream, you know, the, the question I have, and this is, you know, purely, you know, uh, it's sort of a formless question, but would, would Muslim engagement have happened regardless just by virtue of the fact that we had this generation of, you know, American born and raised Muslims coming up? That's a fascinating question. You know, a lot of, a lot of Islamophobia has actually created an American Muslim identity. I think hmm. whether you look at it cynically or instrumentally or genuinely, the rea- I can just I can give you an example from social media. If I talk about Islamophobia within a certain subset of of, of an audience, namely Muslims or people on the left, there's instant buy-in. Mm-hmm. And sure. correspondingly, there's people who think it's all made up, it's a load of crap, it's not real, it's a waste of time, or it's an excuse or a diversion whatever it is, but, but it generates emotions, very strong emotions on both sides. If you looked at American Islam before 9-11, what did you have? You had a community that was very small, that was basically split into two streams. One is an African-American stream that's been here for a very long time and has a very unique trajectory, arguably one that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So it's a deeply American form of Islam. Uh, I, I don't mean in the sense that other forms of Islam aren't American. I mean that it has, it has roots and features that you won't find in any other country. Uh, sure, sure. by virtue of the nation of Islam and, and mm-hmm. experiences like Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X and things like that. Actually, Dr. Jackson said that uh, in, in one of his books that, that America is one of the few Western countries in which you have a, a significant portion of a population that's been there for a very long time that's converted to Islam. Yeah. Uh, so, so you've got that, and then you've got more recent immigrant origin Muslims who f- come from every corner of the world. So you've got this, these two streams. Internally, they're incredibly diverse, and they're moving in incredibly different directions. And the second stream, by and large, arrived after the civil rights era. If not for Islamophobia, it's, it's worth asking, would there even be any attempt to construct an American Muslim identity? I mean, we would have vanished. I was, Berviz, you mentioned the, the great town of East Longmeadow. You lived in East Longmeadow. I lived in Longmeadow. These are two small, mostly white suburbs in New England. Uh, very nice towns, very pleasant, very yeah. tolerant in my experience. Right. I was the only Muslim kid in my high school. Had I grown up in that context, had there been no external force, like we were saying, if there wasn't a, a bad guy, then hmm. w- what would have kept us meaningfully Muslim? I mean, the, the wow. percentage of Muslims who attend, let's say, the mosque, right, is small. The percentage who would have wanted to stick around considering how alienated they felt from the mosque would have been small. And if wider American society was accepting and welcoming and tolerant, we would have fizzled out and vanished 
just like the streams of Islam that came to the U.S. in, in, in the last 100, 150 years. There were waves mm -hmm. of Muslims who came in the 1890s, for example, and they stuck around for a few decades, and then they just disappeared into the melting pot. So far from hating Pam Geller, maybe we should thank her, give her an award <laughs> or something, invite her to a star dinner. That's, well, you I know, mean, that's well, a fascinating point. I'm sorry. Go really ahead. Is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, well, and, yeah. Just, just to pick up on this real quick, Professor. I think what's just picking up on what you're saying. I think what's also illustrative is by virtue of that, by virtue of the fact that there is this uh, uh, force which necessitates a counterforce, right? So, in other words, you have this very active, uh, oftentimes uh, very vicious. Uh, uh, vitriol against Muslims. You then have people who identify as Muslim, even if it's in a very abstract, non-practicing way, but still wanting to have some skin in the game and be able to say, no, I'm defending my right to be this, right? So okay. in, in essence, what we've done is we've expanded the canvas of what constitutes a Muslim. I don't know if that makes sense. I think the TSA has converted more people to Islam than, than any single <laughs> scholar or sheikh or mosque or institution in the world. That's that experience of getting in line and taking off your shoes and that quote-unquote random screening with scare quotes around it. Uh, that experience alone creates, like you're saying, uh, a, an identification with Islam that's different. Because if yeah. you're not religiously Muslim, okay, fine, you're culturally Muslim, but, but we know that the United States is a very powerful almost frighteningly Borg-like ability to influence you into assimilating, that it, it yeah. would have just stamped out this cultural heritage. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, my parents spoke Urdu and Punjabi. What is, what is the realistic chance that in two or three generations uh, their descendants would be speaking Urdu or Punjabi? They, they might still affiliate with Islam, yeah, but, sure. but their cultural particularities would be wiped out, stamped out. And, and that's what happens to cultural religiosity. I mean, look what's happening to the Jewish community. It's, mm -hmm. it's greatest challenge in secular circles is it, it's, <laughs> it's too welcome. It's hard to maintain a particularist identity when everyone around you wants you to be part of them. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely, you know, and, and I think that, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what it is, but, uh, I mean, another something that Dr. Jackson often says that, that, that comes to mind is, is, you know, is, is that persecution isn't the greatest adversary, a, a, adversary, sorry, to religion. It's apathy, uh, you know, born out of irrelevance. And I think that, you know, uh, something like 9-11, you know, and, and again, we may hate to sort of think of it this way, but and, and even the likes of sort of Pam Geller and, and Robert Spencer, they, they, they become this sort of galvanizing force. Right. And, 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 you know, and I think that's sort of kind of what you're alluding to as well in terms of, you know, where would we have been had it, had, had something like that not had happened in terms of us as a community? And I would go even farther. I would say that in addition to that, the extremism we see. Yeah. Uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda and radicalization and social media means now that we need to develop in our communities, almost everywhere in our communities, to have people with enough religious literacy right. to fight back against that kind of argumentation, that kind of right. ideology. It's like an anecdote. You need an anecdote to that. Yeah. 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 An, an antidote. Antidote. Sorry. An <laughs> Well, <laughs> antidote. anecdote is more of a dizzy uncle thing. <laughs> you can tell an anecdote about your antidote. There you go. There you go. This there reminds go. me of the time, and then <laughs> I don't like. How do I get out of this conversation? <laughs> right. I don't want to be a fascist. That kind of thing. And then what do you do? With it? It's, very, it's very hard to know. What's the antidote? Oh, well, I, <laughs> we've just we've just talked ourselves into a circle. It's great. <laughs> don't be but, fooled by South Asian uncles. It, that, that's true. Well, I think all, all three of us have, have had uh, our share of close calls. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, I, I think that what, what, you're, what, you're, what you're talking about, what all three of us are talking about is, is this idea of the, the changing nature of identity. And I think that in, in, in a sense, what, 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 you're, what, what you're alluding to is the idea that, that the American Muslim community is particularly well-placed to to tackle uh, not just the image of Islam that's being painted uh, by these anti-Muslim extremists, but by these Muslim extremists, 
who are, who are also kind of anti-Muslim extremists. Very true. So, I mean, I mean, these, these groups very much feed off each other. And this is something that you've, you've alluded to in, in the past that, I mean, they, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Yeah, yeah, they are. They feed off of each other. And, and unfortunately, again, alluding to what I was saying earlier, uh, some of the responses in our community uh, have, have by and large been non-responses to pretend like there, there isn't a problem. And, and I don't mean that, that we don't take extremism seriously. I mean, obviously, we ritually condemn terrorism and so on and so forth. But I, I don't think we're, we're thinking very hard about what this means in the long term for our communities. So in, in the last year, with the rise of ISIS and the renewed attention given to anti-Muslim bigots and, and from people like Ion Hersey, Ali to Robert Spencer, folks in the UK like Douglas Murray, what are Muslims nationally, institutionally, really actually genuinely doing to combat this? Are we doing anything to combat this? And frankly, I don't think we are. I think we've we've basically remained in silos and we don't realize that there is a lot of danger out there and there's a lot of opportunity out there. And I think that's because we train a lot of our own leadership and a lot of our youth to think within a very Muslim box. So we'll say to a kid, hey, you should be the best you can be in your career. Uh, but we don't say that in terms of religion. Right. So hmm. why is it that when we have religious scholars, we don't train them to speak to the public? Who are our public intellectuals? And and we have very few. And, and honestly, let's look at someone like Reza Aslan. I, he was spurned by many elements of the community initially because he was seen as too liberal, too far out there, not representative of, quote unquote, real Islam. And now he's been embraced because we've come to this realization. It, being Muslim is almost like being in the Republican Party. There's. It's like there's like one or two people you've got who on a national stage will not embarrass themselves. <laughs> right. I mean, let's let's think about it. I mean, that's, I'm not, I'm that's not, a perfect yet very depressing metaphor. Yeah, I'm not I'm not knocking on our leadership. I'm saying they're, they're great leaders, but I'm saying on a national stage, who do we have who can articulately represent the Muslim community, speak intelligently about Islam and, and handle an eye on her CLE? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, and okay, so so you you, you alluded to Ayan Hersieli. I mean, how what what's her deal? I mean, how does somebody like her arise and find as receptive a platform for for her, uh, if you'll pardon my expression, for her nonsense uh, as she has? And, and I have to say, Harun, I, you know, I'd be remiss because I, I, as much as I've enjoyed your writings over the years, your uh, your piece on. Uh, Ayan's book uh, was 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 just outstanding. So really want to uh, give you kudos for that. That was that was brilliant. It was right. a crap book. It's one of the worst books I've ever read. <laughs> Let's be honest. That was absolute nonsense. Like you right. said, it's not an expression. It's the best short book review I've ever read. It's in that New York Times top 100 books not to be published. And she's <laughs> at Harvard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my God, she's at Harvard University, and fine. Uh, Harvard has clearly gone into decline recently, uh, but nothing that another $400 million gift won't fix. Uh, there you go. <laughs> but, but, that's, but see, that's the nature of the conversation. And, and it's, I, it's something that I don't think we fully understand, that, that there are networks of power in this country, and we need mm -hmm. to get into them. We need to be part of them. If you're not right. at the table, as they say, you're on the table. If you're not eating the meal, you are the meal. And, and we should be in the room. And, and the perfect uh, description of, of this was actually given to me by a friend when there was a, a lot of blowback over the White House iftar, which ironically I got a lot of heat over even though I wasn't invited. So it was kind of like a backhanded compliment because I, I'm not actually important enough to be invited, but people assumed I was. So I didn't really know if I just wanted to go with it and pretend. Like, <laughs> did I want to be dishonest and treasonous? I mean, you know, it, was, it was very challenging for me. Uh, mm. it, it was like it was like theoretical vitriol. Like, Haroon, had you been invited, we know you'd go. So, But it know. wasn't even had you been like, hey, you were at the White House of Star. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I could pretend like I was there and then right. you'd hate me, but I was important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't there, and they'd be like, "Let's move on to the like the the, the troll mafia moves on to the next target." Yeah. But it's funny because we were we were talking about it, and someone said, "Hey, why why is the Israeli ambassador at the White House iftar?" Mm -hmm. And and someone I know in the Muslim community, and I, I don't want to use his name because he didn't give me permission to use his name, said that's the wrong question. The right question is, why aren't you at the White House Passover event? Hmm. Wow. Okay. Right. Don't focus on excluding people. Focus on including yourself.
Mm, great point. Uh, b- because if, if you focus on excluding people and, and you're the weaker party, you're going to lose the conversation. You're going to lose because you're the weaker party. And that's right. I think that's the reality with someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali. Uh, we need people to, to talk about what's going on in, in a way that's reasonable and intelligent because this is – this is like it's like the White House did this countering violent extremism summit, the CVE summit, and I can talk about it more sure. more detail later if you want. It was actually very funny and amusing. Um, I think the highlight was when. Uh, no, we'd love for you to talk about it now. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, um, by all but, means. Well, I just wanted to tell a funny story, but then it'll like completely take me away from my point. So I, I will I will circle back. I will do <laughs> we'll the walk around my right. point. Um, <laughs> I, will, I will circumambulate my own argument in the most <laughs> solipsistic moment possible. <laughs> So where do we get these crap Orientalist words from? From I mean, super erogatory prayers right, right. sounds like something that's haram. Um, <laughs> so, but you're really interested in trying. You know, when you're five years old, you're like, I want to do a super erogatory prayer. Uh, but it's because we were colonized by the British and we took their 1850s words and we're. We did ablution. Yeah. Ablution. <laughs> I need to ablute. <laughs> I need to ablute, right. I don't need to know that. Are you ablutin? Yeah, are you ablutin or not ablutin? Yeah. <laughs> Amazingly, we haven't come up with a word for lota, though. <laughs> That's, That's true. Just, I don't even know if there's an Arabic word for lota. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> well, what happened? Itself, perhaps, but uh, yeah, not not the actual uh, utensil. Yeah, you, there, utensil, there you go, yes. <laughs> Water pitcher of the bathroom. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, Picture for here, your privates. Let me. <laughs> before we get super erogatory with this, let's uh, yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, loop it back. No, so all I wanted to say was White House CVE uh, does this one day CVE conference, and people are saying, "Why are you going and feeding into this?" And and my response to it uh, is that first of all, it's going to happen whether or not you want it to happen. Well, and and I think for the sake of the audience, I mean, maybe maybe a little bit of background on on what it is exactly. Sure. So, so the White House did a summit to bring together people from law enforcement, civil society, activists, religious leaders to talk about the, the, the problem, as it's termed, of violent extremism. Sure. And many Muslims were angry that some Muslims were going. And, and there were legitimate criticisms. I'm not saying there, there aren't legitimate criticisms of participation and the content. But my concern is that whether or not you want it to happen, it's going to happen. So it's better that we are in the room when these conversations are happening than someone like Robert Spencer is in the room. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's better that someone who actually comes out of the Muslim community and and cares for the Muslim community is in that room than Robert Spencer. And the second is that when when people like Ayan Hirsi Ali say Islam needs a reformation, when you say no, it doesn't, all it does is it excludes you from the conversation. I I think what I would like to see more of is, is Muslims saying there are there are things we need to address, and, and we are going to offer solutions instead of her solutions or in place of her solutions. Uh, be, because you're not going to have a conversation, you're not going to be part of a national conversation if your response to Islam is, needs a reformation is, no, it doesn't, everything's fine. Huh. Because, I mean, we know that's not true. Clearly, everything is not fine. Uh, right. Clearly, we have right. problems and challenges in our communities. That doesn't mean that they're unique or insurmountable or endemic to Islam or to Muslim cultures, but there are problems. Uh, the fact that there is a caliph and it's ISIS is a bit of a problem. Right. <laughs> um, right. This is a, this is something probably none of us could have foreseen or imagined even 10 years ago. 10 years ago. A- and yet here we are uh, facing this. So, so what do we do with this? And and that's my concern is that, again, it's that that – non-responsiveness, which gets us into trouble and, and we're on our back foot and, and we end up constantly basically catching up and responding instead of proactively setting the terms of the conversation. Wow. Okay. And then I can, I can do my funny story now if that. If yes, that. yes. Please. So, so here White House did a CVE countering violent extremism, uh, one day summit. It wasn't actually at the White House. It was building right across the street. And then they had lunch for us. And this was actually the funniest thing in the world because they took they, they brought all the attendees into uh, I think it's called the Indian Treaty Room. Uh, apparently, it's a room where uh, Indians signed treaties so they could be ethnically cleansed with some sort of legal framework attached to it. Um, meeting Native Americans, um, not South Asian fascists. Uh, so uh, <laughs> they bring us into the room and there's no food, uh, and and the food never comes. And in the end, they end up getting us Subway sandwich boxes which was beautiful because it was like, here's this real problem of extremism and we take it so seriously. We're going to get you subway sandwich boxes. 
Uh, like that's the sort of prioritization of resources in terms of war versus diplomacy. Because I can bet you, you know, if the drone wanted a sandwich, the yeah. drone would get a really nice sandwich. <laughs> if the Muslim wants to peacefully work to combat extremist ideas, wants a sandwich, then he is going to get whatever subway option. But then I was imagining in my head that they probably ordered from some desi food place and probably called in. And can you imagine that conversation where some guy's like, hey, uh, Abdullah, uh, the White House called. They want us to bring our food truck in to deliver like halal food for lunch at the summit. And they're probably like, it's a trap. <laughs> can you imagine that conversation? Like, well, if it's the White House, we can't not go. But there's no one hell, like no way in hell we're going to go. Uh, so then they probably just became so paralyzed that nothing happened, and then they had to order subway. Um, I think that would be – like that alone could be the basis for a great movie. Like James that, Franco, that's like, Ion Hersey Ali, something like that. If you're somebody get Seth Rogen on the phone. There's Seth Rogen. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, make that happen. He could be from Mashallah Sweets and Punjab Bakery. It it writes itself. I think we you know we we've got the makings of of the next the interview right here. It, that's the dilemma of modern Islam. Well, I mean that, that's I think I think that's a really good segue in into the broader conversation. I mean, what what does it mean to be a, a Muslim in in America, being quote unquote modern? How, you know, because 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 the way it's represented in the media and it's very insidious. And it's by the way not something that's exclusive to the post nine eleven. Uh, uh, point of view, because you know, I was going through my old movie reviews, and I found uh, the piece I wrote about the siege back in 1998. Harun, you remember that movie, right? Yeah, yeah. And and the thing about the movie, first of all, like as a film, it's very engrossing. It's very effective in that sense. But what the movie does is it presents – you have the good guy Muslims, quote-unquote, and the bad guy Muslims. And the good guy Muslim is Tony Shalhoub, and he's Farouk, but call him Frank, and he drinks, and he cheats on his wife, and blah, blah, blah. And the the bad guy Muslims, they're the ones that are praying, and they're outwardly religious, right? So in other words, that's the distinction that's always been there. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a new show uh, this fall – on ABC called Quantico. I don't know if you've seen the trailer for it. I, I, I encourage did, you to, yeah. to, to watch it. So yes, it's Bollywood meets Hollywood, right? Because we've got right. a, a Bollywood actress in there. Yeah. yeah, weirdly she plays someone with a white name, which is just kind of. I mean, I thought it was like, wow, ABC as its lead, you know, chose a, an Indian right. model and actress Priyanka Chopra, and instead yeah. she's like Jessica. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. but, but there's a hijabi. There's a woman in a headscarf who's one of the the main characters. Yeah, and, and so. Part of me is like, that's great, that's progress. But then part of me is thinking, she's only a she's only a main character, she's only a good character because she works for the FBI. So you get that good Muslim, bad Muslim dichotomy. Uh, but, yeah. but you know, maybe maybe that's how it happens. And and I also I mean I sympathize that that at the end of the day, shows care about the bottom line. We're we're three or four million people, and we're not necessarily a, a, an organized market. Uh, so there's, I mean, there's, I mean, how many Latino or Latina characters are on TV? It's still vanishingly small. How many African American characters are there on TV? It's still pretty small. So to, to expect Muslims to have good roles, but it's exactly like what you're saying about the siege. It's the same dichotomy. Here we are 17 years later and it's the same yeah. dichotomy again, good Muslim, bad Muslim. So, I mean, what, what, what is the role that Muslims need to be doing to shatter that particular paradigm? Because, because it's, because I've had this conversation where people tell me, they're like, well, you don't really follow the Quran. You know, and, and by the way, the, the one thing you can always count on an Islamophobe to say is, I, I've read the Quran. Like that, have you read the Quran? I've read it. And that's you know that's like their go-to thing, and it's like well I, I I don't know what response you're expecting. I've read it too, you know. There's there's always that, but but that's that's exactly it, right? The 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 that paradigm. How do we break that? We get Priyanka Chopra to convert to Islam. <laughs> and then, I think Priyanka Chopra is a proof of God because I don't think evolution alone <laughs> can produce. Is that is that super derogatory? I don't know if it's an appropriate <laughs> comment to make so, <laughs> right on the show. But, but no, you, you're right. And, and to be, to be just brutally honest about it, this is a reality. Every, every society has its truths, its sacredness, its, its ideals and values and symbols. And, and that's a reality. And, you know, every, every community that, that enters the American mainstream is forced to negotiate that tension between upholding the ideals of America 
and then challenging America to be honest with itself. And and the yeah. best you can hope for, and, and this is a really rare instance, is look at Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, mm -hmm. He has become an American icon, but he has been removed and, and neutralized in a certain extent so that he only is made to or allowed to say things that are convenient. Uh, that said, sure. that, that's a big deal. I mean, let's not let's not be too too hard on the reality that that Muslims as Muslims, I don't think we face the kind of systemic discrimination that frankly some of us seem to wish we did. Uh, huh, right. There's not that kind of discrimination that I think that most of the discrimination Muslims face has to do with the fact that we're ethnically and racially other. Sure. Obviously there's visible symbols in our instances, but if we watch the news, if we pay attention to American society right now, the, the reality is that if you're a black man, then your life may very well be in danger. Uh, sure. Muslims well, and, don't, and don't register in, in nearly the same way. So for all the, the all the negativity, the Arizona mosque siege that happened just uh, sure. just last week, I believe, which was mm -hmm. terrible and frightening, uh, that still doesn't compare to what we see almost every week now, which is an unarmed black man or unarmed yeah. black couple crazy. assaulted or attacked by the police. That's systemic discrimination. So I think that you're right. There is that good Muslim, bad Muslim dichotomy, and it's there. But but we have a lot more allies and friends and opportunities than we realize. Sure. I think we just need to seize them, and I think we are, but but I think it's a slow process. Well, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, obviously what you're saying, it's absolutely true. I mean, all, all you know, gosh, uh, just, uh, for you know, watch Selma and, and look at, you know, the the struggles that, that uh, the, the black community underwent and their allies underwent during the, the civil rights era. But um, I do, you know, I do wonder if even if things are not, as bad as God forbid they could be now we are seeing there's a loosening in the permissibility of of what you can say against Muslims that wasn't the case before and certainly would not be acceptable for any other ethnic or or you know religious group I mean that's a fair statement right i I agree I agree and and my response to that is that we should be using the time we have now yeah. to accumulate the moral capital and to, mm. to get ourselves into the places we need to be yeah. to, God forbid, if, if the need arises, if the situation gets worse, to, to redirect it towards a more positive outcome. This is, sure. I mean, obviously Obama has his flaws like any other president, but come on, this is a window. This is an opportunity we may never have again in the near future. Mm. Uh, we have no idea who's going to be the president in, in 2017. And we have no idea what the situation in the Middle East is going to be like or what the threat of radicalism in America will be like. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the the best we can hope for, and I, and I said this actually when, when we were talking about a CNN conversation earlier, some friends and I were talking about the value of having Muslims on TV, is that CNN is going to report the, the radical Muslim stuff because that's what people are going to watch. Uh, we're not going to be able to prevent them from doing that. Maybe the best we can hope for right now is that Muslims become the people through whom Americans get the news about Muslims. So sure, at least sure. in their minds, they say, okay, these are some very bad Muslims, but the person who's giving me the news, uh, yeah. who I trust as an authority, is someone with a weird name. Uh, <laughs> so is, is, is someone who challenges or, or makes more complicated that easy equation. And, and maybe that's what we need to do for now. I'm an incrementalist. I don't, I don't believe... Um, I'm, I'm sort of like an old school Berkey and conservative. I don't believe in radical change. I believe it's very rare and very hard to pull off and it often yeah. goes awry. That's my, my personal take on things. And, and, well, and it's certainly borne out by, by geopolitics in the, in the last, say, say, you know, 15 years or so. I would, I'd go, I'd say the, the, what's happened to Islam in the last 200 years. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think a lot of us threw out a lot of things figuratively huh. speaking, yeah. in the Islamic tradition without realizing the wisdom behind them. And, and it's, mm. it's, it's very hard to rebuild something. It's very easy to destroy it. That's what scares me about America today. You're talking about Islamophobia. I think it's part of a deeper trend where capitalism is just brutalizing and eviscerating everything uh, that has made American society function in the way it has for a very long time with no other motive other than the profit motive and with no idea of what that will lead to. Uh, and, and maybe one day people will turn around and say that was a mistake. Uh, but it's a lot, it's a lot harder to, to rebuild something when it's gone to even conceive of rebuilding it. And I think that's what Muslims worldwide are facing that, that the entire edifice of our tradition, our heritage has been demolished to a significant degree. Mm. And we are trying in real time to rebuild a house, even if it's being attacked and we're debating whether or not we should even have a house. 
Well, now I think I think this is actually a good a good segue point to uh, your participation in the uh, MLI uh, initiative. Yes, um, on, on behalf of the, the Hartman Institute, and and you know a, a big reason for 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 that uh, program is about sort of building uh, bridges between communities that maybe don't necessarily have open dialogue, and and you took a fair about a fair amount of controversy uh, for for having participated in that. I did. I did. Uh, you know, to, to, for those who aren't familiar, uh, MLI, Muslim Leadership Initiative, was a program started by uh, a group of Muslims uh, who saw and identified the Shalom Hartman Institute, which is based in Israel and in, and in the United States, primarily in Israel, uh, as a partner for a very unique kind of program. Shalom Hartman trains rabbis and has responsibility for Jewish studies curricula across the world. Uh, they're an incredibly influential organization. Uh, and they often also do programs with Christian leaders uh, and other intellectuals, people who are not necessarily within the Jewish tradition. And so Muslims approached Shalom Hartman Institute and asked if they would be willing to put together a Muslim leadership initiative, which would be a chance for American Muslims to learn about Judaism, Israel, and Zionism from the Hartman Institute directly. And so sure. I was part of the inaugural class. That was about two years ago. Uh, and and it, sure, it, it generated some controversy in some circles, although I, I don't think it was as sustained or as significant as initially I, I feared it would be. Hmm. Well, and, and, and you were part of the first cohort that went. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it, Wajahat Ali went and, and uh, he's a previous guest and, and Rabia Chaudhry went and, um, um, I, well, and, and I, I mean, it was, it was a pretty lengthy list, but, but you guys were, were, were part of it. And did you, anticipate that it, it, there would because because i think at, at the, the term that i that i heard uh repeatedly was was faith washing yes yeah yeah uh, did you anticipate that backlash i anticipated a backlash i think i was a bit naive uh in that i was surprised that many people took at face value criticisms of the program without speaking to me including people i know very well Sure. That was a bit disheartening and disappointing. I mean, obviously, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I don't expect or, or want everyone to agree with me. Uh, but I, I was taken aback that folks I had worked with for a very long time and who knew I, I dedicated years to the American Muslim community would suddenly assume that uh, that I had sold out sure, and, and that I had been co-opted, that I, I was and now am a Zionist, uh, which, sure. of course, I am. Uh, uh, I am, of course, a Zionist. Uh, I'm also, according to, to Robert Spencer, the Alfred Rosenberg of Islamic jihadism. So I'm, wow. I think I'm the first Zionist jihadist uh, in, in the New York City area. So that's it's special. It's something to put on a book, <laughs> tag, at least. Uh, but, <laughs> that's a pull quote from, from Robert Spencer. But, but look, there's going to be there's going to be strong criticisms about something like Israel and Palestine, there's going to be intense debate and discussion. And that's a good thing. Uh, I, sure. I don't, I don't have any issue with that. What, what, what did worry me is that many people who wrote about the program did so without reporting about the program in a proper or appropriate way. And it makes you realize that, that there are some Muslims who oppose Fox news because it's Fox news. Mm -hmm. And there are some Muslims who would be fine with Fox news as long as it didn't pick on them. And, and the reality oh, is that some of the criticism was principled and legitimate. Uh, some of it was based on misinformation. And some of it, frankly, was anti-Semitic. And, and that's deeply mm -hmm. concerning to me that, that there are people uh, in the community with platforms whose fundamental opposition to the program was based on nothing more than the fact that they don't like Jewish people. Sure. Uh, and they won't say it openly, but it's there. And, and it's very hard for me having gone through what I've gone through in the last 15 years and knowing the history of the United States and knowing the history of Israel and Palestine to understand why anyone would be comfortable with that kind of form, that, that kind of argument. But it's a reality. Sure. It's there. Of course it is. I mean, there's a lot of Muslims. Well, there. Yeah. Of I mean, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've never trusted Klingons and I never will, you know, it's that. Exactly. That, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Although I, I, I was always partial to Romulans, but they just never translate well <laughs> in movies. I don't know why <laughs> it was Star Trek it's, nemesis, but God, that's like the relationship of Star Trek nemesis to Star Trek is like modern Islam to Islam. It's just a disappointment. <laughs> uh, there's a clone. The clone looks nothing like the original. You don't know why this got funded. 
Uh, why is everything so dark? I mean, it's just, it's absolutely terrible. It's, it's, it's really that's, by the way, that's, that's Tom Hardy as the clone of Captain Picard. I know. And, and look at what happened in, in, in Batman, right? I mean, he's completely <laughs> different. I mean, why, why didn't we get that guy? Right. <laughs> I love that we 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 made a seamless transition. From, Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. It's 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 amazing. Uh, Pervez, come on, you have to you have to give props for well, that. I, I totally do. And in fact, when you were talking about like using it as an analogy uh, to you know uh, sort of pre modern Islam and modern Islam, and I couldn't help but think of another probably apt analogy would be to compare it to the uh, prequel trilogy and the original trilogy of Star Wars. Ouch. So, and again, I think we'd be remiss to have us three on on a, on a conversation and not bring up Star Wars. So, yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah, how, how <laughs> you've, got, you've got some recent expertise on, on that particular area. I, so. I actually think this is the perfect response to, to Ion Hersi Ali, the question of does, does Islam need a reformation is, is JJ Abrams. I, if you think, I mean, I, I know it sounds ridiculous, but just just give me a minute to to expand on the idea. Y- you have to have credibility in a lot of different circles before mm. anyone's going to trust you with Star Wars, which is about as close as you can get to sacred in a secular context. Uh, wow. We don't give Star Wars to anyone, and and J.J. Abrams is probably one of the very few people who anyone would let approach Star Wars. We know that's true, and and his task is to take what made the original work. And to convince the original fan base that it's worth watching and that it's loyal to the original while also being able to communicate it to people who maybe don't know about it. And, and in, a, in a sense, that's what reforming Islam means. And I don't mean revising Islamic scripture. I mean rebuilding Muslim life for the needs that we have now, for the problems we have now, is you have to convince people, one, that, that you actually care about this, two, you know what you're doing, Three, you get what made it work in the past, and four, you're able to make it work in the present. And and that's what that the pro, that's what we have to say is the problem with Ion Hercielli is not that she isn't pointing to real problems. It's that it's like giving her Lord of the Rings and being like, here you can make the Silmarillion. Just just go. Right. We'll give you half a billion dollars, and you can make a movie. And she'll be like, what's Frodo? And then right. we'll all die inside a little who, bit. Who, who? What? What authority does she have? How she has exactly. Been- Exactly. Yeah. You, you have to have the ability to do it and you have to have trust. Even if you have the ability, you might not have the trust. Those are, those are two different things. And J.J. Abrams, honestly, J.J. Abrams is one of the few people that I envy and do like black magic against because the, can you imagine <laughs> a greater, look, what a great life, man. You got to reboot <laughs> Star Trek and Star Wars. That's like, that's not right. That's too much power <laughs> for one man to have. But you know what, though, just just to pick up on what you're talking about, I I think that when we when we talk about this idea of of who's earned the right and authority, et cetera, just keeping that Star Wars parallel going, George Lucas created the movement, right? He found he started the revolution, mm-hmm. and the revolution rejected him. Yeah. Right. Wow. I mean, the the prequel films were his truest expression of what Star Wars is. That's so terrible. I mean, right when you because because it's it's Lucas Unbound, no restrictions. He's paying for it out of but whatever he thinks of, he he can wish into existence. And uh, almost you know, uh, collectively, society said uh, we're not down for this. That's why you can't have top-down reform in the Muslim world. <laughs> That's there. You hit the nail on the head. There you go. See, you I give, did it by accident. You I give someone you. power, and then they come up with Jar Jar Banks, and then. <laughs> <laughs> You're just gonna shoot yourself in the head. That's you know what's funny is that I'm I'm in the process right now. I'm writing a chapter of a of a book about Star Wars that's gonna be out later this year. And the topic that I and I did this to myself. I was like, hey, why don't I write about the prequels? And you know, people always dump all over them. I'm gonna try to uh, look at them holistically and and sort of find the upside. And I am, you know, I'm 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 a miserable miserable man right now. Like this this conversation is me taking a break from self flagellation because I just I can't do it. Is there anything positive? Well, so so here's here's the approach I'm taking. Uh, I think m- more more uh, theoretically than an execution, the the approach to politics is much more sophisticated than what we see in in the original trilogy, as far as how it's not just simple black and white. How there's a lot of, there's shades of gray and evil actions result oftentimes from good intentions and things like that, which is not something that. Uh, the original trilogy really gets into. So that's, Wait, can, that's, I, can I just stop you right there? When you say evil actions, do you mean evil actions in, in the prequel universe or that the prequels themselves are evil? 
I mean, in universe. Oh, okay. Because I can see oh, that I they are, you they could... are kind of evil, but maybe not I... that evil. <laughs> no, I mean in the in the film in the films, right? Where uh... Uh, ostensibly, you know, Darth Vader becomes a bad guy from from the best of intentions. So, I mean, there's there's the nugget of something interesting there. That is deep. That is, it's kind of like uh, post colonialism in the Muslim world. A lot of these folks that we now uh, mock and deride and and hate. Uh, the Hosni Mubarak, well, maybe not Hosni Mubarak, but Gaddafi uh, and, and the Shah of Iran were, were kind of like Anakin. They were the new hope. They were, um, well, he wasn't the new hope, but you know what I'm saying. They, 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 it was assumed that they would they would bring balance to the force. Well, they well, would I mean, bring S- things Saddam to a better Hussein. place. Saddam yeah. Hussein to some extent, right? I mean, he, he was backed by the U.S. During the, during the 80s. Was Saddam Hussein, by the way, one of the dumbest dictators in history? Uh, he's got to be up there. He's up there because at some point, don't you think – there's like 600,000 troops in Saudi Arabia, like right across from your border. At some point, don't you think you would maybe panic or, you know, do something or prepare? it's a very interesting, you know, it's an interesting reflection on the condition of the Muslim world that it's like sometimes being Muslim is like being Lord of the Rings, except there's no Aragon <laughs> or Theoden or Frodo or Sam. The best you have is, is Saruman. So the, you just, <laughs> just, the, it's just a t- and then ISIS shows up and you're thinking, dear God, like, why? Um, where is our, maybe Aragorn is like Imam Mahdi and, and we're waiting <laughs> for the arrival of, because Aragorn was descended from, from the house of Numenor. So he, he had oh, that, that, that royal blood and, and that history of being a nice person. Wow. Well, so wow. in that vein, does, does, does the army of orcs, like, are they, are, are they, are they like Yajuj and Majuj, right? I mean, Ooh, is that, I yeah. think you've got it. I think you've got Gog, Gog and Magog for the Gog and Magog. Yeah, I don't know what the ring of power is here. Maybe it's a lookup. But... <laughs> Let me see. I'd have to think about that one. <laughs> Drawn, you know, like, but you know what's funny is that because the, if you remember, the Lord of the Rings movies came out right just shortly after nine eleven, uh, like two months after, in fact. And this was a conversation that was being had in the media. It was oh, it's a metaphor for you know the the Mordor. It's the East. It's meant to be the Muslim world. And yeah, I mean, th- that that was a conversation that was absolutely being had. You know, yeah. I mean, when we we were talking about MLI a little while ago, uh, one thing I it's sort of a rule now is that if if the criticism I get is reproduced by someone on the same side, the other side, then I'm immediately very skeptical. And so I I remember right after uh, right after nine eleven when when Fellowship of the Ring came out, it was actually that December, I believe. Uh, yeah. People were saying, yeah, Mordor is like Al Qaeda, and. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm thinking to myself that this is a bit of a misinterpretation of the balance of power here. Um that you know, Mordor threatens to overwhelm the world. That's not Al Qaeda. Uh but but it's interesting that that the MLI experience showed me how much we mirror each other's fears without mm-hmm. realizing it. And part of the problem is we don't talk. And that's not to say that we should talk and accept one another's narratives merely because they are each other's narratives. But to be aware of them and to be alive to them. And mm. many times I found that uh, my Israeli interlocutors would say that they would say things, these sort of very common talking points that, that the Palestinians have whatever 20 other countries they can go to or 50 other countries they can go to, whether it's Arab or Muslim. And, and it's just one little country that's Israel surrounded by hundreds of millions of people. And sure. They are not aware of the fact that if you merely flip that around and say, well, actually, most people in the region don't look at it that way. They look at Israel as the the forward operating base of the United States, the most powerful country in the history of the world. And so far from being an isolated, uh, lonely, uh, uh, defenseless or vulnerable society, Israel is is heads and shoulders above everyone in terms of power because of who's backing it. Oh, and, wow. and those are the sort of things that you need to hear. Uh, but but the sad reality is we were talking about J.J. Abrams, and, and I, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but in order for people to hear a narrative, they have to trust you. Yeah. And the reality of, of it is, is that a lot of people will don't trust us. Hmm. And and I think we can take prophetic wisdom from from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he 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 signs a peace treaty that is is entirely stacked against him and his community. It, it's not even a peace treaty; it's basically a capitulation, and his own community is almost ready to revolt against him. In that fact, is, yeah, and, and the Quran has to sort of validate it, right, with revelation, yeah. saying that no, this is like a manifest victory, and you only see it later on in life, but. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and they're thinking, I'm sure the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, are thinking, what is he doing? And and if we're right, 
and and they were right. They were in the right. Then why are we handing over anything to anyone else? And mm -hmm. and it's the same thing that I tell people in terms of MLI. Of course, the Palestinians are in the right. Uh, they're the they're the original victims of the conflict. That's not to excuse terrorism or extremism, but if we're looking at what happened, they were the ones who were displaced, and and that's historically not debatable. Uh, but but the fact of the matter is, is in order to get anywhere you have to have a relationship of trust and you have to have a relationship of, uh, that enables you to have a conversation because otherwise it's sort of like, who are we talking to? And, and, and it, it, to me, it's, it's a sad reflection of, of, of the Muslim world right now that 10 or 15 years ago, the Palestinian cause was central and it still provokes and, and should provoke strong emotion. But in terms of the hierarchy of needs in the Middle East, it's, it's fallen a lot farther down. Uh, there's sure. Libya imploding, there's Egypt's dictatorship, there's Syria's horrific civil war, there's ethnic cleansing in Iraq, there's a war on Yemen. I mean, the, the region is imploding and, and the Palestinians are, are suffering more because they're not even in people's consciousness anymore. And, and I think ultimately one of the reasons this is happening is because the way that we have responded to challenges in, in the last 100 or 200 years is to pretend they're not there. To me, the boycott movement, although it, it, it has value, and I, I personally do practice an economic boycott to the extent I can, the reason it can become dangerous is because it can basically exclude you from conversations that you should be in. So for me, MLI right. was important because I don't see the value of academic and cultural boycott. I think it's self-defeating. When I was working in D.C., I was hoping that sanctions would be lifted on Iran. I, I don't believe that excluding people gets you anywhere. I, I don't think it worked in Cuba. I don't think it worked in Iran. And I don't think it's going to work in Israel. And and my hmm. fear is that if, if we exclude ourselves from conversations, then we marginalize ourselves. And, and we're already pretty marginalized. So how is that going to get us anywhere? And right. that's the challenge of modern Islam is we've become an inversely proportional civilization. That the more of us there are, the less impact we make in the world. That mm -hmm. I think by 2050, Pew was saying, what was it, that one in three people yeah. in the world is going to be Muslim. Right. I think by 2100, three out of every two people in the world is going to be Muslim. I mean, we're like, we're accelerating past humanity at this point. It's just kind of like phenomenal growth curve. It's horrifying and impressive <laughs> at the same time. And yet what is, what is the collective impact we can make? Why is it that we as a community are able to do so little for Palestinians? I'm not talking about violence or, or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, to, to lobby for them, to, to, to draw attention to what's happening to them and, and other places in mean, the Rohingya and Myanmar, where Muslims have been persecuted for decades and are now basically being driven out of their homes and stuffed into concentration camps, where is our ability to leverage our numbers and turn it into anything? And I think to get there requires being in conversation. So I think in in, in a weird way, it goes back to the, the J.J. Abrams point that you, you trust certain people to do certain things and tell you stories, and, and, and it's even more important to take those lessons when it comes to the real world. Well, and and I think that's actually a good place to pivot into, uh, and I wanted to make sure to have this conversation with you. You're, you're working on your memoir right now, which is due out in, in 2016. Yes. Um, and it's it's uh, How to Be a Muslim is the title. Yeah, tentatively. Um, I, if I figure out how to be Muslim by then, then that'll be the title. Oh, Otherwise, even yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, now, now the, be... the, the, the description I see is, is it describes your loss of faith even as you became a voice uh, for your faith. I'd, I'd love for you to unpack that for me. Wow. Uh, yeah. So when I went to college, I, I grew up in a very religious family. And I was very well educated in Islam, although it takes time and maturity and experience to realize that knowing something is not being something. Uh, it might take you a little bit closer to being that, but you're still not that. Uh, and, and so I was in a very odd place. For a lot of my friends who developed a powerful relationship to their identity, they discovered Islam on their own. They had a sense of ownership uh, because they were able to sort of distinguish Islam as a religion take it however loaded you want to make that term, from Islam as culture, which really means from their parents' culture to their own culture. So it's just they replaced one cultural understanding of Islam with their own cultural understanding of Islam and then claimed that they were a transcending culture. But whatever, that's fine. They did what they had to do, and they moved on with their lives, and now it's their identity, it's our identity, and you feel it. My problem is that my parents uh, were very, uh, uh, especially my mom and her family, they were a, a scholarly family. And I, and I don't just mean scholarly like, mullah in the pejorative sense but people who wrote poetry and and my great-grandfather's books are in columbia library and it's sort of very overwhelming 
uh, legacy to be part of, which meant that my parents wouldn't just say, oh, we don't do X, Y, and Z. They would produce source proofs for why we don't do X, Y, and Z. So it's very sure. hard to argue with uh, people who know what they're talking about um, and very frustrating because ironically then uh, you don't have a relationship to religion that is your own uh, because it's very hard to find room for yourself. So I, when I went to NYU, one of the reasons I went to NYU was because I got rejected by every Ivy League university I applied to. Uh, that was probably the main reason, um, but I'll make myself feel better about it and pretend like that was like my first choice. Um, actually, UPenn rejected me on April 1st, which was awesome. Like the whole letter, like crushing my hopes and dreams was on April Fool's Day. Uh, wow. So I, yeah, they they didn't think it was funny <laughs> because they never wrote back, which was incredibly rude of them. So in case they're listening, <laughs> I, I have not forgotten UPenn. Uh, so <laughs> Ben Franklin. <laughs> yeah. MU Pennsylvania. Uh, so, but you know, when I went to NYU, I, I, for the first time, I found a Muslim community that was really diverse. And it occurred to me that I wanted to be part of a community where I could explore my identity. A little bit like you were saying about being culturally Muslim. Obviously, I had a spiritual connection to Islam and, and a moral connection to Islam, but it was also a cultural connection, and I, it made me very happy. It, and I found out that I was actually very good at community building. Um, I was a community organizer who will never be president, um, but. That it was something I enjoyed, and it allowed me to experience some sort of profound relationship to my religion, and it made me feel like I was doing something positive for my community and my faith. And maybe it was me making up for the fact that I wasn't as religious as I should be or thought I should be. I don't know. But I did it, and I was good at it, and I kept thinking to myself, if I'm actually honest about where I am spiritually and I tell people, people aren't going to be ready for that. Is that hypocrisy? Maybe it was. I don't know. I think now the community is a little bit more open-minded and generous in its inclusivity back then, not nearly so much. Sure. So I hid it and hiding things generally doesn't work out well. Uh, mm -hmm. So the memoir is a little bit uh, of a warning about what happens when there is a disconnect between who you present yourself as and who you actually are. But in my mind, again, the most I could say was that this was something I was doing for a few years and then I would go on to a respectable suburban lifestyle, possibly in East Long Meadow and uh, <laughs> have my BMW <laughs> 535i and the house and all those wonderful things that I will never have thanks to the rise of China. But <laughs> it's, it's over. I've, I've come to terms with it. It's just, I'm never going to pervade as you were like, uh, you told me you'd been to my parents' house once a long time ago. I was like, that's good. You said my parents' house. Cause I ain't never owning a house at this point. Uh, so hey, we live in California. Don't forget. So dude, I live in New York. Right. Right. That's what I'm saying. When I, okay, when I tell people go. I have a dishwasher, <laughs> Other people who live in America are like, wow, that's the most uninteresting fact ever. Uh, good for you. Welcome to the 19th century. When I tell people in New York I have a dishwasher, because we live like way out in Brooklyn, they think that I'm insanely wealthy. They think that I must have sold out to Zionism and made hundreds of thousands of dollars. We just happened to find a building with a dishwasher. But that's like, so, so New York is like California. It's just absolutely terrible. A long story right. short, you know, it was... I, it was 9-11, and then suddenly I found myself thrust into the spotlight. People would literally stick microphones into your face and say, Islam, Jihad, Sharia, terrorism, polygamy, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. Explain now. 1,400 years. History. And you had to answer, and I'm a doofy 21-year-old who wears his backpack around and doesn't know what the hell's going on, just hoping his fly is zipped, and suddenly he's on every TV station because his Muslim community, which he was the president of, was a 15-minute walk from ground zero. Hmm. And so suddenly I was in this awkward position of representing Islam and I didn't want to do it, but I felt like I had to do it. And John Stewart did a great sketch about, you know, had he not been Jewish, uh, he could have been president now if he hadn't dealt with stereotypes. And we wonder about those kind of things that if we were, if we were mainstream, what doors might've been open to us that aren't open otherwise. And part of the reason doors are open is because you don't have to waste your time trying to open other doors to even get into the room in the first place. Mm. So, that to me that the reason I wrote the memoir is because I, I think like a lot of people who get into the activist lifestyle, I completely burned out. I, I crashed and burned. I was deeply depressed. I'm bipolar. I was just really struggling. I became suicidal. I, I mean, I lost everything like job, uh, savings, uh, my marriage, everything fell apart, healthcare, all those things. And I actually left the U S because I had nothing left here. Uh, uh -huh. I, I went to Dubai and basically tried to rebuild my life. And, and part of it was because I was trying to do something, I wasn't supposed to do. And, and part of it was because it was just too much pressure. And, and I was, I was of the opinion that I was, I was a firefighter and I had to respond to every fire. So 
my job was to embody the correct response to everything. And so I was writing and editing and running a company and doing historical tours and pursuing a graduate degree and traveling two or three times a month and doing public speaking and just churning in and, and, and constantly trying to do something for the Muslim community, which is why when I, when I mentioned the response to MLI, it was hurtful because I thought to myself, I've spent 15 years of my life doing this and, and nearly killed myself doing it. Huh. And I would assume that people would think, okay, someone who's dedicated years of his life or her life to something isn't an idiot. Right? So there, there is undercurrent of people would say with respect to MLI that, oh, you're being co-opted. And I would say, well, show me how I'm being co-opted. Give me proof of co-optation. Show me where I've suddenly flipped on my community or my beliefs. And they'd say, well, there's none yet, or you don't realize it, which is in effect saying that that either I'm too stupid to realize it, or we just as a people, Muslims namely, are so dumb that we are always only ever someone else's pawns, uh, which is deeply depressing if you think about it, but that's how conspiracy theories work, that we assume that we're just someone else's material for their own advancement. Uh, but, but that's why I wrote the memoir, because I was trying to come to terms with what happened. Uh, it's very... It's very frightening and, and alarming when everything you've relied on in your life is taken from you. Huh. And this is now something common probably to our generation that there are no more certainties that people like Alan Greenspan love to call it the age of turbulence. And I'm sure it's great if you're in first class and have a ride waiting for you at the airport. But for most of us, the age of turbulence is a horrifying, terrifying, frightening thing because we don't have these certainties anymore. There's no, I mean, I remember I found myself talking to some friends a few weeks ago about whether or not we would push our kids to attend high level or, or big name colleges, which for our parents' generation, that was default, of course. That was a given, right? Yeah, I mean, you had to do it. And now I, I literally find myself thinking, is it really worth it to go two, three dollars $300,000 into debt? Why? Why should you do that? I mean, I, I remember telling we were talking about California, New York. I was literally thinking that if the amount of money that was spent on my college education had gone into buying an apartment in New York in 1998 when the market was low, I would have more money now than probably anything else I could have done would get me. So, I mean, it's a wow. little bit disheartening because everything you were told to do, you know, you did all the right things, you, you crossed off all the boxes, and yeah. here you are, and, and nothing's working. And this is a story for a lot of folks in our generation. Some of us pursued careers that are, are well compensated and that's great. But for a lot of people, those options aren't there anymore. And, and even careers that allowed you to live a decent lifestyle in the past and a respectable lifestyle are no longer present. And I think that's what's undergirding some of the Islamophobia out there. It's not actually Islamophobia. It's this fear that, that this whole thing, um, that America is not working the way it was supposed to work. And, and who's, to be, who's to be blamed for that? And, and we're to be blamed for that. In some people's minds. Hmm. Wow. Well, I, for one, am, yeah, I mean, j j just f hearing you talk about it, uh, Haruna, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, your uh, memoir coming out because I think that so many of the issues you, that you've talked about, I mean, I, I just remember, I mean, I, as you've been talking, I've just been sort of nodding my head here uh, or, 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 or in, in, in agreement because, um, you know, just growing up in similar activist circles, uh, going through some of the same issues that you talk about, um, I think you're going to strike a nerve with so many people, you know, not only of our generation, but also, you know, in, in, in some of that Muslim leadership circles that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you know, I mean, I think of a very well-respected imam, actually, in fact, from Brooklyn, uh, you know, uh, who worked effort, you know, tirelessly for other communities and, and raising money across the world for Muslim causes you know, uh, gets diagnosed with prostate cancer and finds himself without health care, you yeah. know. Uh, and so these are realities that I think we as a community have to have to really, you know, grapple with and, and, and I think discuss. And so I think that your book, you know, will, will be a will, I mean, maybe perhaps not the first chapter, but certainly, uh, you know, a, a, a move in that direction. So looking forward to it, Harun. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and with that, I mean, as, as we sort of wrap things up here, uh, Arun, I know you maintain a very active social media presence. So uh, where can people find you if they're, if they're oh, looking to actually, see you? Actually, Arun, I'm, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask, because while you were talking, another thing I wanted to ask you real, real, real quick, Zaki, before we uh, yeah, wrap up. Um, mm -hmm. So you wrote uh, The Order of Light. I mean, I, I haven't read it, but I mean, I, I take that, that that was a fictional work, right? Neither have I. I didn't read it either. I just... <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, but, but curious, it, it, was, it was a piece of fiction, correct? Yeah, yeah. Any, 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 any uh, uh, you know, plans to sort of revisit fiction? I know you do a lot of obviously writing, but 
Yeah, actually, uh, about uh, a year ago when I was sort of wandering in Dubai, uh, which, by the way, I, I was privileged to be able to do because I have a blue passport, so I'm not trying to, to mm. Um, mm. pretend like it was that bad. But I, I was there. I was living with family, and I was enjoying uh, uh, the ability to be away a little bit. I started writing fiction again, actually, and, uh, and oh, okay. uh, actually writing um, three novels right now, uh, which I can best describe as uh, sci-fi meets Bollywood. Uh, so it's, nice. it's, it's my Lord of the Rings moonshot. So if all else fails, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go for that book. And then if it doesn't, I have a plan C, uh, it requires <laughs> swallowing my pride. Um, but I'm, I'm going to write a book, uh, about how I was, uh, an oil chef, uh, in the Gulf and had a harem and tons of money and cars and everything you could ever want. And I gave it up to be unemployed and absent health insurance in America, but at least I have freedom and I'm going to, do the right wing talk show circuit. It'll be something like heretic or how I escaped polygamy or something like that. I'm not really sure. Uh, but, uh, I think that that'll be my plan C. Uh, that's not really fiction. I think that's, uh, <laughs> nice. It's a new appreciation for why people do the things they do that maybe, maybe I yeah. really needed health insurance. You know, I mean, I hate, you know, I, I can't knock on her. I mean, health insurance is a great thing. Now that we have a Muslim president, we all have it. But if we didn't, if we didn't have a Muslim president, maybe, maybe we didn't have, maybe we wouldn't have health insurance. You know, it's the secret handshake. Yeah, exactly. The fist bump. The, fist, yeah. the terrorist fist jab. It's not a secret anymore, man. It's, yeah, that's true. It's terrorist fist jab. We true. have no secrets left anymore. It's terrible. <laughs> Well, with that, yeah. um, where can people find you, uh, you online if they're, if they're looking for you, Hiram? Uh I have a Facebook page. I put all my writings uh, and random musings up there. I'm on Twitter. It's uh, H.S. Mughal, M-O-G-H-U-L, old school 19th century colonial British spelling, like we were talking about. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I'm a senior correspondent for Religion Dispatches, uh, which is a magazine out of University of Southern California. So uh, if you're ever on Religion Dispatches, you can find me there as well. Nice and and yeah yeah and we want really want to emphasize the the stuff that you you write and and uh, a lot of the the stuff lately has has been just uh, incredibly uh, thought provoking not to say it hasn't yeah. been throughout but I've I've especially enjoyed sharing uh, some of your recent pieces with with um, uh, not just Muslim friends but with non-Muslim friends also well thank absolutely. you very much thank yeah, you absolutely and I think uh, also Zeki uh, you know in terms of uh, by the time folks actually listen to the episode, either we'll be uh, in the midst of Ramadan or just at the uh, very cusp of Ramadan. So uh, Ramadan greetings and, uh, you know, Ramadan Mubarak to all our listeners uh, and happy Ramadan. So to you as well, uh, early, Harun. Yeah. Thank you. You guys as well. Ramadan Kareem. <laughs> yeah. And and hopefully uh, we, we will get to have you back on. And uh, um, I'm hoping we'll have figured out what to call uh, Lota, like what the new, new term. By then. That's right. It's a yeah. challenge for the community. Let's that, that's that's our homework. Hey, you know, question. in fact, I'm thinking, you know, Zucky, it would be we, I think we would be remiss not to do a special like Star Wars episode in December. So if we do like this episode that just discusses the movie, uh, The Force Awakens, we'd have to have Harun on to talk about it. So, yeah. Oh, my goodness. You know yeah. what you should do is you should do what would Star Wars look like if it was written in a Desi community. <laughs> that would be that would be epic. I think we need to rope in with Jahat Ali. And, and, uh, yes. Hey, I'm down. I'm down. I, yeah. I have nothing to do anyway. I just watch Netflix and wait for Star Wars. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Hey, There's I'm, nothing I'm, else I'm, left. I, I think I, I was in part just I was in part joking, but I think I think that, I think yeah we, we would be totally uh, remiss not to do that, Zucky. As big diehards as we are, so. I'm I'm down for that. Yeah. And uh, with that, uh, real briefly, let's let our audience know. Uh, you can find us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. We're also uh, on Facebook, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence, so please do hit like. Um, also hit up iTunes, Stitcher Radio, leave us a review, leave us a star rating. Uh, let us know how we're doing so that we can keep improving the show. And, and we get terrific emails all the time, so, so please, right. do, uh, please do. And you'll, find, and you'll find two or three of us, two out of three of us on Huffington Post, so certainly look out for both Haroon uh, as well as Zeki on <laughs> On Huffington Post. Well, thank you, and yeah, you can, my my movie reviews go up there uh, every week or, or thereabouts, and also, of course, the the movie film podcast uh, is available there as well. And uh, on behalf of my uh, colleague Pervez Ahmed and our guest Harun Mogul, uh, my name is Zaki Hassan. This is Diffuse Congruence, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>